Hello, hello, hello. Here we are, ready for another part of Into the Sideways World by Ross Welford. We're going to have chapter seven and eight tonight. So it's about 15 pages, so I'll get moving. Otherwise, we'll be here for about 15 minutes, won't we? Here we go. I'm pedalling like mad to keep up with Manny. The backpack he's tossed to me is bouncing on my back. To the south, on my right, a massive full moon is rising. Manny's talking to me as we cycle, but his words keep getting snatched away by the wind. Be famous, man Willa. Out of the water. Fish in its gob. Shelters in a bird sanctuary. Eats the eggs. Probably escape from a private collection of exotic pets. In the end, I can't keep up with him, even though it's not far. It has stopped raining, at least. The open twilight sky over the sea ahead of us means I can see him easily. Where the road bends round to go towards the lighthouse, we stop. Manny chuckles and says, <laughs> As I expected. We're not the only ones hoping to get pictures of the Whitley Cog. There are six cars in the normally empty car park and people are positioned at various lookout spots with binoculars and cameras on tripods. Tripods, not tripads. All pointing at the beach. Think about it, Willa. Not only do we know where to look and they don't, but we've also got an advantage that the rest of those suckers haven't. A half smile flits across his face. You've been carrying it. I have. I reach for the backpack that Manny gave me earlier. Inside is a cardboard box containing three tins, the size and shape of extra large Sorry, cans of tuna. I lift one out. The label's not in English and each tin is slightly swollen on the top and the bottom as though it has somehow been inflated. Hey, steady, that one's ready to burst and you do not want that to happen. Manny's been a bit bossy about this whole thing so I can't resist tossing him the can across the space between our bikes. I mean, it's a tin can, what's the worst that can happen? What? No! My throw is rubbish, to be truthful, but not as rubbish as Manny's catch. The can hits his wrists, bounces off his other hand, which had shot out to grab it, then it strikes the middle of his handlebars. It finally splits open as it lands on the ground, spraying liquid <laughs> at high pressure everywhere, all over the bath, path, his bike and his jeans. Two seconds later, the smell hits us both, and by smell, I don't mean aroma, a light whiff, but a stink so completely overpowering that for a moment, I'm stunned into inaction. The choking, fishy stench is worse than anything I've ever smelled before, including when the whole sewage system of Happy Land blocked up last summer, and for a day there was a large, brown, stinking pool right by reception. <laughs> In my haste to get away from the smell, I slip on the can juice and bring Manny down with me, soaking our clothes as we scramble to our feet. After a few seconds, the can stops spraying. Instead, it just oozes a clear, slimy liquid onto the grass like a burst wound. I stagger away, panting and trying to breathe through my mouth. Meanwhile, Manny is moaning, Oh no, oh no, oh no. As he stands up, he turns to me, You complete... But he stops when he sees me almost vomiting. What in the name of... I pause to cough again. What is that? That, Willa, is called Sir Strumming. I try to repeat it. Sir Strumming? And that is... I expect him to say that it's some sort of industrial cleaner or a high-grade solvent. Or maybe one of the banned chemical weapons that have been on the news. Anything but what he says next. It's, um... It's a Swedish food. Jacob eats it. He keeps it in a shed in the backyard. I don't need to ask. Jacob has lent this to Manny in the same way that he lent his camera. He he eats it. Please tell me you're joking. I know. It's a bit ripe, isn't it? Interrupting the story a second. That stuff, I've seen people eat it before on YouTube or tried to eat it before on YouTube and people just can't eat it. So, I don't know whether you can see the spelling. But you'll have to do a little bit of a... Here it is, look. You'll have to do a little bit of a safe search. You see it? On there. To um see if you can see anybody eating it. Make sure they... Because sometimes they have naughty words on there. So maybe turn it down whilst they're eating it. Then you can see how stinky it is. Anyway. Where did I get to? I know. It's a bit ripe, isn't it? A bit... Manny, that is the foulest thing I have 
ever, I honestly think the stink has fuddled my brain a bit, is herring that's gone rotten or fermented or something. Then they put it in tin cans that can swell up because of the gas produced and then they, um, you know, they eat it. Jacob says it's best with sour cream. I'll let this thought sit in my head for a moment. I suppose if you're going to eat rotten fish, why not add cream that's gone off as well? But why? I wail, generally baffled. Why would anyone eat that stuff? Manny shrugs. Jacob says it's like Marmite. I give up. Oh, I give up. I'm still feeling too nauseous, but I've caught up with Manny's thinking. That's our bait. He nods. Uh huh, devious, eh? The beast is going to find it irresistible. Half an hour later, we're cleaned up as best we can with clumps of damp grass and dried up wet wipe from my pocket. But the smell lingers in my nostrils and on my jeans. The open can smells less badly. It's the juice that stinks rather than the fish itself. Although just the thought of eating it is enough to make me gag again. We've left the beach car park to the amateur cryptid spotters and now we're near the birding hide, the Nakadol caravan. Manny's given me a piece of chewing gum to disguise the smell of Sir Stroming in my nose. That's fresh water, see, says Manny. We look across the small shallow lake that years ago my great granddad excavated for a wildlife reserve. Every animal needs fresh water, right? So this thing is bound to come back at some point. I just saw the ears and the head. No wonder Mordy spotted it. They were huge. We'll entice it back with our smelly fish. Honestly, Manny seems so sure of himself that I'm almost beginning to believe him. We empty most of the burst can down by the water's edge near a half-submerged supermarket trolley and trail the remaining juice up towards the hide. There are still two other cans in the backpack that Manny carries especially carefully in case two, they explode. It is now a chilly spring evening when the cold comes through the broken caravan floor. In front of us, and very low in the sky, the moon is spectacular and full and seems bigger than usual with a slight orange tinge. Without taking his eyes off the moon, Manny offers me a sandwich from a triangular pack, but it's tuna, and I don't feel like eating at all, so I take another piece of gum instead. He's been quiet for a while now. It's making me a little bit uneasy. Why is it bigger tonight? I say to break the silence. I mean... Surely the moon doesn't change size. It's not bigger, he mumbles with a full mouth. Just looks like it. It's a super moon. He goes quiet again and I have to prompt him. What's that then? It's like he has to make an effort to pull his eyes away. He swallows his mouthful and says, It's the world's biggest illusion, isn't it? For a start, it's at its nearest point to Earth in its orbit. That's called the perigee. Then there's a full moon at the same time as a perigee. You get a super moon and it appears up to 14% bigger. He says this fluently like he's learned it. I'm sort of suspicious. And you know this how? I ask. He sighs as if weighing up whether to tell me this. I, I sort of researched it. He almost sounds embarrassed and I want him to say more so I keep quiet. At last he says, I found out later that my mum went missing during a supermoon. That's why I'm interested. I feel a bit bad now. It's really sad, Manny, I say. He nods and makes a strange gulping noise and when I look over he's turned his head away. Manny, you all right? He takes deep breath and turns back, his jawline set firmly like it was when he first told me about his mum. Then he nods. Yep, fine, just... I give him time. He shifts his position to look at me. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at me closely and takes a deep breath. If I tell you something, do you promise you won't laugh? I nod quickly. He closes his eyes as though he's forcing himself to say something. I can feel it, you know, that moon, a super moon. Sometimes, anyway. I stare at him and he stares back. I want to say, don't be daft, Manny. But it's obviously taken some courage for him to say that. Slowly, he puts his hand out towards mine and I feel compelled to take it, even though it's a bit odd. I'm half expecting a little static electric shock like you get from the carpet in the school's music room. But there's nothing. Well, maybe the faintest, almost undetectable tingling, which could easily be my imagination because Manny's gaze is pretty intense. In a low voice, with his face so close to mine that our breath clouds become one, he says, Can you feel it too? And I nod slightly, even though I'm not sure I even do. What is it? I say with a dry mouth. He pulls his hand away and I realise that my palm is damp with sweat, my own, I think, and my heart is racing. Dunno, he says, looking back across the water. I sometimes get it, though, but this time it's more because this is an extreme perigee. The moon only gets this close to Earth every few decades. Thing is, according to the experts, you're much more likely to see a cryptic 
cryptid during a supermoon. Something to do with the increased light and the gravitational pull of the moon on the earth, increasing the tides and affecting... <gasps> Shush! Affecting what? Manny is staring straight ahead, eyes wide. Shush! <laughs> I follow Manny's eyeline, but I can't see anything moving. In fact, the absolute stillness and silence of the night is mesmerising. The moon is now higher in the royal blue sky. It has moved westwards to the right over the earth and is reflected perfectly in the bird sanctuary mash. I check the time. It's half past ten. I'm a bit nervous because mum and dad will surely be back soon. There's barely a breeze and I can hear the waves breaking on the beach a few hundred metres to our left, though even that is pretty faint. A distant baby's cry is carried on the air from one of the bungalow lodges. Out at sea, a ship's light winks. Manny reaches for the camera with its telephoto lens and lifts it to his face. He's seen something. I hear him swallow, then he hands the camera to me. Middle of the lake. I put it to my eye and focus on the moon's reflection in the water. And there is something, definitely something. A black shape moving through the water fast enough to leave a V-shaped wake behind it. Duck? I whisper. Manny tuts and snatches the camera back. Too big, wrong shape. By now, the shape is nearly at the edge of the lake and close enough for me to see even without the camera. There's a head, shaped like a cat's or a dog's, but with bigger ears. And behind, a slight hump rising from the water with a... Is that a fin? Like a shark fin? Finally, a tail, standing vertically like a periscope, follows at the rear. This is awesome, breathes Manny, and he snaps more pictures, the quiet click of the camera's button sounding almost loud in a confined hide. Here he comes. The animal walks out of the water and heads straight for the tiny pile of rotten fish that we left as bait. It lowers its head and starts to eat while Manny continues to take pictures. Neither of us dares to speak. We now get a good look at it from about 50 metres away. Its fin seems to have collapsed into its back and is barely visible. What we see is a huge beast, the size of a wolf or a cheetah, with a sturdy body and a cat's face, but longer. Every few seconds it stops and lifts its head, a bit. its big triangular ears pointed outwards and its thick tail waving from side to side, flicking droplets of water. Then it sits on its haunches like a dog and lifts a piece of fish to its mouth with its strange hand-like paw. Do you see that? Manny nods and keeps snapping away. It's like we're watching a monkey at the zoo holding food in its little hands. Then it rises on its hind legs and looks around, its eyes glinting yellow in the moonlight before resuming its four-legged stance and coming nearer to us following the trail of fish. I don't think I've breathed for about a whole, a whole minute. This is definitely not somebody's dog. It's like no animal I have ever seen. I'm startled when under his breath Manny curses. Oh no, 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 no. He's looking at the little screen on the back of the camera and pushing buttons frantically. What's wrong? They're all hopeless, Willa. Every single one, look. He hands the camera to me and I look on the screen at the back. He's right. In some of the pictures you can just about make out a dark, distant animal shape. But that's about all. I must have got the settings wrong. I had to turn the flash off, obviously, but oh, I don't know. Poor Manny's face. I don't think I've ever seen anyone look so disappointed. I watch the cog moving through the distant shadows towards the beach and out of sight. We need to come back tomorrow, I say. We can't wait. Jacob won't um lend me this camera again. We're going to have to follow it. The cog's path had taken it round the back of the cryptic spotters and their cameras. None of them have seen it. We've been peddling like crazy for at least two kilometres, passing the big white dome of the Spanish city leisure complex on our right, riding along the pavement and the paths, catching glimpses of the strange beast as it lopes along in the shadows of the low, sandy dunes below us. There are no lights on my bike and I've completely lost track of time. Two or three times we think we've lost, but I'm so into the whole chase now that it never occurs to me to say, come on, Manny, let's go back. Now and then we'll see it, a flick of its tail behind a rock, or a flash of its eye and we keep pedalling until we're almost at the end of the beach. Here the land juts out a bit to form Browns Point and Browns Bay at the end of Whitley Sands just as it becomes Culvercott. Look, there he is, says Manny and he's right. The animal is running ahead of us, almost hidden against the dark cliff wall. There are one or two cars on top of the seafront road and a single person on a long, long beach throwing sticks for a dog. Manny and I have mounted the pavement, cycling furiously. 
We pass a couple walking arm in arm and the man shouts, Oi, slow down, you little pests! But still, no one has noticed this strange animal only a few metres away in the shadows. I want to stop someone and tell them, but that's just mad. What am I going to say? So I ride on till Manny breaks hard at the steps leading down to the promenade that forms more than half of the semicircular bay. Browns Bay itself isn't much to look at. There's a steep cliff with some steps from the road to the sea-lashed promenade. It's all overlooked by the abandoned Culvercott Hotel. It's off-white front shed in flakes of paint like dandruff. Manny doesn't stop to ask me or even look back, but he dismounts, hoisting his bike onto his skinny shoulders and carrying it down the steps with me following. The broad concrete walkway curves around until at the end there are some more steps, slimy and seaweedy with a rotten, rusting handrail, down to the tiny, so-called beach. It's more like flat, grey and brown rocks and pebbles. Twice a day is almost submerged beneath the rising tide. The cave is a crack shaped like a big upside down V in the cliff about three metres high and there are signs warning you against going in it. When the tide's up you could paddle a kayak inside or even swim I suppose but hardly anyone does. It's rocky, the tide's too strong and it is flipping freezing. If you want to swim Culvercott Bay is just around the headland. Standing on a cracked old promenade, I feel like the rest of the world has broken away and drifted off somewhere. The dark cliff looms above us and muffles the sound of the traffic. The black sea swishes in and out, the white breakers slapping against the seawall below us. And there, about 20 metres away by the mouth of the cave, is the cog, its chest rising and falling from its long run, a rope of drool hanging from its mouth. It looks straight at us. It can't actually be waiting for us, can it? Surely that's my imagination. We lean our bikes on a bench and start to walk to the end of the promenade. Neither of us has said anything and the cog hasn't even moved. It's strange. There are cars rumbling along the main road behind us, but Manny and I are stalking a mysterious creature like primitive hunters. We are so near to the cog now, but it still hasn't moved and my mouth is dry as sand. Almost inaudibly, Manny says, it's watching us. It definitely is, I know it. He fumbles with his bag, pulling out Jacob's huge camera. He holds it in front of him as he steps over the rusty barrier and starts down the slippery steps. I follow. Two more steps and there's now nowhere for the cog to go. There's hardly any beach left as the sea licks its foamy tongue further up the rocks. My heart is beating so hard I can almost feel it in my feet. Manny, we don't want to get too close. It could become a great... Shh! he says and holds up his hand. There's a blur of movement and suddenly the cog's darting into the darkness of the cave. Come on, Willa! We haven't followed it this far for nothing. We need to get proper pictures. He's already halfway along the little beach, ignoring the seawater going over his shoes. I don't really have a choice, do I? Well, right, I do. I could turn around and go home, but something happened today. Something inside me dissolved in the rain and the arguments and the knowledge that Dad may be called up to fight in a war. By the way, Manny says without looking back, do you believe me now? I believe you, Manny, I say as much to myself as to him. Then I take a small step forward, that is. In fact, a giant leap. They're going to follow the cog into that cave. The tide is coming in. That's really dangerous. Don't ever do that in real life. This is a fictional story book. Never, ever go into a cave, especially when the tide is coming. But I wonder, when they go in, are we going to go into the sideways world? Okay, 18 and a half minutes. I need to stop there. Whew.